Let me now uh, uh, turn uh, to the uh, central moral doctrine uh, of the Gorgas, uh, where Socrates says that it's better to suffer evil uh, than it is to do it. Uh, This has had enormous, I think, cultural impact. Uh, some uh, in, in Western society, uh, some people, I think, quite rightly link it to the Pauline doctrine uh, that one must never do evil, though good may come of it. When he announces it to his interlocutors, uh, they're quite incredulous. Uh, and one of them, in fact, callically says to him, come Socrates, are you serious? Or are you not? Because if you're serious, you've tur this turns the whole world uh, upside down. And Socrates himself, it seems to me, and this is controversial too, but it seems to me, my sense here again of the character is as of someone who had discovered something and was himself shocked by the discovery. Uh, it's always a complex matter talking about discovery when it comes to moral matters because it's no accident that there are no, no Nobel Prize winners in ethics or no encyclopedias of ethics and no little textbooks of ethics. Uh, but, but sometimes new moral thoughts do come into the world. Uh, and that it's better to suffer evil than do it, I think, was such a thought. Uh, the thought that came much later and was expressed by Kant uh, that all human beings uh, have an inalienable dignity to which there is owed an unconditional respect. That too seems to me a new thought in the world, although it may be a variation on an older one, uh, which that is that every human being is sacred, a secular version of an older thought. Uh, but it did seem to me, it does seem to me, from the character of Socrates, that he thought of this as a kind of discovery. Uh, now, and what I think he thought he had discovered was what it is that, with a kind of shock, is what it really means to wrong somebody. How terrible, the, kind, the distinctive kind of terribleness that wronging another person can have. And <clears throat> for that reason, I'd be inclined to call it a moral precept, uh, a precept that it's better to suffer evil than to do it. There are uh, people who say that the whole concept of morality has no application to the ancient Greeks at all. Uh, and there are people who would prefer to uh, say that we should talk here of e the ethical rather than the moral. I think there is reason for distinguishing the ethical from the moral, uh, though there's no agreement about how that should be done. Uh, but the ethical is, is a more general category. Uh, when Socrates says that the unexamined life is no life for a human being, is unworthy of a human being, uh, which implied a sense of requirement to lucidity throughout his life, uh, I wouldn't think of that as a moral requirement, or at least it would seem to me very unnatural to say that someone who failed at this or felt no sense of that requirement whatsoever and thought it, that it was perhaps at least it's nonsense, it would seem to me quite wrong to say of such a person that they were somehow immoral, that they had failed in morality. Uh, but when you're talking about people being wronged in certain ways, let's say by being betrayed, or to take an example that I'll discuss in a moment by having been murdered, uh, then it's natural enough to speak here of morality. Now, philosophers uh, who talk about this often say that Socrates was offering here an ethics of self-interest. Uh, that he was thinking that if you came to see how you were harmed by wronging somebody, you would see that you had reason not to do it. Uh, <laughs> actually, as though one might say, believing Socrates, after one had seriously betrayed someone, ha, you think you've got it bad. I'm the one who's really suffering. Because Socrates tells us it's better to suffer evil than to do it. The worst kind of misery is to be an evildoer. That would, of course, be absurd. Uh, and, but that's uh, implied indeed, or implied as a possibility in the thought, 
that the Socratic precept gives one, in any straightforward sense, a reason uh, not to wrong somebody. It deepens one's understanding of what it is to wrong somebody, but it doesn't give one a reason, I'm suggesting, in the sense in which ethics of self-interest are intended to give reason to be moral. Now, uh, I give it uh, as, an, there, uh, as now, m m most of these ethics of self-interest uh, turn out to be one variant or other on the thought that if morality is something of human origin, it must have been devised by human beings for reasons. And those reasons must be that morality as a set of rules or a set of dispositions to conduct is intended to serve human interests as those interests could be described whether or not you cared for morality. Or to take a very, very crude example, uh, someone might say morality is at least in part a set of rules designed to protect us from the ill will of others, uh, let's say. As a, and everybody knows you don't have to have care for morality to know that it's a bad thing to be the victim of someone's ill will and therefore it would be good if there are procedures in place to protect you. Uh, and if they were encouraged then to develop virtues such that they didn't even want, etc., etc. Et this is one way of thinking about it. It's a very, very natural, almost irresistible way of thinking about morality. And there's a, a, a philosopher called Van Richt, Van Richt, I should pronounce, who once said provocatively, there are many forms of value, but moral value isn't one of them. And what he meant by that is that moral value is itself an instrument to realize other things that human beings value. Be a flourishing of one kind or another, security, safety, that you can elaborate in very complex ways on what morality is intended to serve, what purposes it's intended to serve. But the thought is that it's essentially something that serves a purpose and therefore the corollary is can be adapted when we realize it no longer serves a purpose or is serving its purpose badly. It's up for creative adaptation. Against that, it seems to me, Plato and Socrates, or Plato through Socrates, uh, said that morality is not the servant of any of our purposes or interests, it's their judge. And what he meant by that, I think, was to say that any purpose you like to specify, which as the purpose of morality, is itself something morality will assess. So if you say, let's say crudely, that it's a means of social cooperation, it's morality that will decide what are the decent forms of social cooperation. Uh, or if you say that it's a form of human flourishing, that's meant to promote human flourishing, it's morality that decides what kinds of decent what kinds of flourishing a decent person could enjoy. Or if you want to say that it serves the common good, the same thought is, well, morality judges what, what, kind of, what kinds of things can, not only what means can be decide, uh, chosen to procure the common good, but what can count as a common good. So, that, so, the, the, so on the one hand, there's the thought almost hypnotic with common sense, that morality is there to serve human purpose and interests. And on the other hand, the thought also can be put in, as I put it in a slogan, a very platonic thought, that morality is not the servant, but it's the judge of our desires and interests and our purposes. And that was one way in which I think Socrates answered Protagoras, when T Protagoras says, the man is the measure of all things. Because the natural way of reading Protagoras here would be as saying human beings have desires, interests and purposes, morality is there in one way or another to serve them. Well, I'm inclined to think, and I, 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 this is controversial too, that one gets an understanding uh, of what Socrates meant when he says it's a terrible thing to be an evildoer. Uh, if one thinks about remorse, 
Philosophers have tended not to think much about remorse because they've tended to treat it as merely a psychological state that's attendant upon the judgment that one has done wrong. Uh, a psychological state that's encouraged in us because it's a means of, as it were, preventing wrongdoing later. If, you, if, if uh, wrongdoing causes you pain, it's a way of internalizing, so to speak, moral values. But I think you can think of remorse differently and think of it as a kind of bewildered coming to realize the true significance of what you've done. And indeed, that's how it's most naturally expressed when people say, my God, what is it that I did? How could I have done such a thing? How could I have betrayed my friend in this way? The natural expressions of remorse are of a kind of pained, bewildered realization, not just an affective state accompanying a realization, but actually a form of that realization. And if you come to think of remorse in that way, uh, then it's not hard at all to think of in what way it's a terrible thing for a person who's wronged somebody to have wronged uh, that person. Uh, in a book of mine, A Common Humanity, uh, I tell a story, a fictional story, uh, of a character, I call him N, uh, who characteristically goes home walking past various homeless people. And there's one particular homeless person, an old man, nobody cares about him, he's utterly friendless, uh, who persistently asks him for money. And sometimes he gives, sometimes he doesn't. Uh, but uh, on one occasion, the old homeless man asked for money rather aggressively, standing in front of N, and N pushes him away impatiently, uh, and uh, the homeless man falls onto the ground, hits his head on the curb, and is killed. Now, here's a man, that is, uh, a homeless man, uh, who's such that nobody would really think about it if he were to die of natural causes. Uh, and N wouldn't think about it if he'd heard that he died the, the night before. He'd probably think about it and pass on and very quickly think about other things. He's a human being who in one sense means nothing to anybody, including N, in, in the sense that I've specified. Nobody thinks about him, worried to die, no, nobody truthfully would... would would care. He has no friends. But once N has killed this person, not out of viciousness, out of a sort of irritation, we would understand it, we would find it intelligible if N was haunted for the rest of his life by the fact that he'd done this. We would even find it intelligible uh, that N might at some stage have suicidal thoughts. My point isn't that it would be right for him to have suicidal thoughts. But I do want to say that it's part of our understanding of the seriousness of what it is to kill someone in those kinds of circumstances. It's part of our understanding of that, that we should be that we understand that people should be tempted by it. That's the kind of seriousness that it has for us. And yet, looked from at another point of view, it seems utterly astonishing that a man who meant nothing to anybody and meant nothing really to end should suddenly become so important to end once in has wronged him. Important to him as revealed in the remorse that he feels, not for the fact that this man is dead, but for the fact that in, he killed him in the way that he did. So, and this is, in a way, this is a kind of commonplace about morality, when people say things like, if I were to do such and such, I could never live with myself, or I could never... I look in myself in the mirror again. 
But what they mean then shouldn't invite the reply, well, you probably could live with yourself, why don't you try it? You know? <laughs> In fact, Aristotle says the easiest way to overcome one's resistance to doing terrible things is to repeat them. <laughs> and we all, we all know that sadly to be a terrible truth of human nature. The blood-soaked 20th century taught us that, if it taught us anything. Uh, but of course, nobody means when they say, I couldn't live with myself if I did that. They don't mean, if I could live myself, I'd be happy to do it. And in the same way, Socrates isn't saying, if only as a matter of fact you didn't harm yourself, it would be okay to do this. But as a matter of fact, you do. Because if it were simply a matter of fact, it invites the response, well, let's see if I can get away with it. And that's, in fact, the response he gets uh, in the dialogue when he discusses the matter with Polus. Uh, Polus, so as well as saying that it's better to suffer evil than to do it, Socrates says that evildoers are necessarily miserable and pitiable. And uh, Polus uh, effectively laughs in his face and says, come on, you can't be serious about that, and tells him a story about a tyrant Archelaus, uh, who, who drowned his brother in a well to succeed to the throne and has put down many enemies in the way that tyrants do. Uh, and Polus describes this man, Archelaus, as living happily and cheerfully uh, and so on, and says to Socrates, come on, you're going to tell me this man is miserable and pitiable? And it's very interesting what Socrates says. He says, I don't know. It depends how he stands in relation to good and evil. And I take it he means not that if he did these things I don't know how he stands, but I can't be sure that he did what he said. But if he did these things, then yes. He doesn't say things like, well, you know, people who do this sort of thing suffer sleepless nights, so he might not be so cheerful. He doesn't say people who do this sort of thing well, the army eventually turns against them. He doesn't even say, if he doesn't get it in this life, he'll get it in the next. And one reason we can see that is because there's a wonderful pathos. There's a kind of point about the drama. There's a wonderful pathos when Socrates, when, when Polus says, incredulously, finally something is dropping, the penny is what? It depends just on that? On nothing else? No further consequences? No other story about internal disintegration, sleepless nights, anything of that kind? No further stories about disharmony in the soul? Nothing that looks like spiritual gut ache and so on? No, it depends just on that. And again, it seems to me, if one thinks about certain kinds of examples, it's not so hard to understand. People do sometimes sorrow uh, over people who've done terrible wrong. Mothers do it, uh, and fathers do it, over their children. Uh, not necessarily because they're going to end up in prison, but just because of the wrongdoers that such a person has become. And if that person doesn't care a damn about the wrong that they've done, the child doesn't care, is indifferent, morally indifferent to what they've done, they sorrow even more for that person's condition, for what they have become through the doing of what they've done. So I think that's what Socrates meant when it said, said that it's better to suffer uh, evil uh, than it is to do it. And I've gone, I'm going very badly. Uh, over time. Um, can I go five minutes? Sir? Because I want to, I want to uh, say a little bit, um, I'm going to in fact skip some of the political part, uh, but I want to say something about what Socrates might have meant uh, when he said that a good man cannot suffer harm in this life or in the next. Uh, because uh, had I been more organised in my lecture, uh, I would have connected it with a certain kind of hope in politics. 
uh, because my question was going to be, uh, if it's true uh, that we can't uh, believe in, his, in the inevitability of historical progress, if it's true, as I think it so patently is, that nobody knows what the future is going to be, whether it's going to be good or whether it's going to be bad, there's a question of whether hope is something that is necessarily conditional upon an assessment of how things will turn out in the world. And I think that uh, there's a conception of hope that's different from that. Socrates certainly didn't mean, when he said a good man can't be harmed, that he can't suffer all sorts of misfortunes. Obviously what he meant, at least this much he meant, uh, that there could be an ethical perspective on misfortune that enabled one to consent to it rather than to be resentful concerning it. He meant at least that. And that is not very radical. Lots of people believe that. And Aristotle believed it too, but he wanted to say, Aristotle wanted to say, but only with a little bit of luck. There's a certain point at which misfortune will so cripple and maim a life that anybody observing that life would say, better that this person had never been born. And it seems to me Socrates was saying, was, was rejecting the thought that there must be some lives such as any compassionate person looking on would say, better that the person living that life had never been born. Wittgenstein, uh, in his lectures on ethics, uh, when he's trying to give uh, his audience a sense of absolute value. Interestingly, he doesn't talk about uh, prohibitions that one should adhere to without exception. Uh, he talks about certain kinds of experiences. Uh, remorse was one of them. But the other one he described as feeling absolutely safe. And he then says, well, of course, there's a sense in which this is nonsense because safe is necessarily a relative word. Combined with absolute, it just makes no sense. Uh, but he didn't want, but uh, this was the kind of nonsense uh, Wittgenstein thought had a certain depth. And on his deathbed, uh, it's reported uh, that he said to his doctor, Tell my friends, tell them, tell my friends, that it's been a wonderful life. And what the person who reports this, and uh, was first reported by Norman Malcolm in his memoir. Malcolm says he was very moved by this because it had seemed to be, to him, in so many ways, a very unhappy life, certainly a life full of pain and misery. What I think is very interesting about Wittgenstein's remark, and that helps us understand what Socrates meant, was that I don't think Wittgenstein was intending it as an assessment of his life. It wasn't a remark that invited anybody to say, well, I can see it was good, but I don't know about wonderful. <laughs> you know, wouldn't you like to reconsider this? A bit extreme. It wasn't an assessment. It wasn't in that sense a judgment. It was the expression of an attitude to his life which was not conditional upon those things that would enter into an assessment of what was going to happen and what didn't happen. And I think if one thinks of that, it's just a fact that people do take this attitude. It's not, a, it's not something, as it were, that one can admire or be moved by, conditional upon ascribing to a metaphysical principle of some sort. One can respond to this without any belief in any metaphysics or anything like this. But it's, it can express a kind of unconditional allegiance or love of the world. And I think this is what Plato, let me put it this way, when Plato is talking about the forms, which are metaphysical entities that are indestructible, not in time, not in space, and so on, he has many, many reasons for doing it. Some are purely logical reasons about how is it that we can call so many different things by the same name. In moral philosophy, people think it's to provide an objective account of morality against the sceptics. But it would be real overkill, it would seem to me, 
to try to, to try to get moral objectivity by inventing the forms. It really is a case of what is it, using a sledgehammer for a and the, but I think if one, what, what is wonderful about Plato is that no matter how abstract the metaphysics is, it's often presented in, in certain kinds of forms that enable it to connect with certain kinds of human experiences. And if one asks, what, what is it that made Plato speak like this about the form of the good? I think it was he was, he was, it's a kind of test, testimony to, a kind of act of witness, now to the historical Socrates, saying at his trial, a good man can't be harmed, and trying to make sense of that. And I'll just close with, a, with, with re reading something that I've always thought expressed this in a t totally uncontentious way. Uh, Wonderfully, but in a way uncontentiously. Uh, I apologise to people who've read it because I've quoted it else in some of my writings. But it's from Pablo Casals. And it's something that he wrote when he was 90 years old. Uh, uh, 95. He says, For the past 80 years, I've started each day in the same manner. It's not a mechanical routine, but something essential to my daily life. I go to the piano and I play two preludes and fugues of Bach. I cannot think of doing otherwise. It's a sort of benediction on the house. But that's not the only meaning it has for me. It's a rediscovery of the world of which I have the joy of being a part. It fills me with an awareness of the wonder of life, with a feeling of the incredible marvel of being a human being. I don't think a day has passed in my life in which I fail to look with fresh amazement at the miracle of nature. It seems to me that nothing I, I know expresses so beautifully and so briefly, and to my mind so convincingly, something that I would call an unconditional love of the world, and to express it without anything that looks like religious or metaphysical commitment. Casal says that he thinks that not a day has passed in which as he puts it, he's failed to look with fresh amazement at the miracle of nature. But I don't think that he means merely that he's felt he's been incredibly lucky to have had all those years what some of us have only once in a while. When we wake up one morning and think, God, it's so wonderful to be alive on some of this spring morning. To wake up like that is, of course, a joy, and for do it, to do it even half the days of one's life would be wonderful. But that experience repeated, how many, many times it was repeated, would just be that, the merely contingent, accidental repetition of something that might have occurred, in essence, only once, and then the rest of one's days being gloomy, cursing them. There's no inconsistency whatsoever in the, of having woken up to a fine spring morning for 30 years and then saying, what a rotten thing it is to be alive. No inconsistency at all. So what Casals expresses there isn't just the, the fact that he's so glad that as a matter of fact he's woken up feeling so good so many times. And this is why I say it expresses a kind of unconditional love of the world which would make certain kinds of attitudes to the world look like, a, like ingratitude. The same thing appears, I think, in Albert Camus' writings uh, in the myth of Sisyphus, which, pretentious though that book is, uh, starts off pretentiously saying the only real problem in philosophy is suicide uh, and goes on in the same awful way. But what there is in it is something much finer than many of Camus' much more clear-headed philosophical critics and that is the same expression of an unconditional love of the world, mediated in his case by a sense of its beauty. And that, I think, is what Plato was doing partly when he was talking about the form of the good and how we might understand his talk of the form of the good 
as a response to his wonderment, his amazement, his astonishment, his need to bear witness to the actual historical Socrates saying at his trial, but you must remember this, my judges, that a good man can't be harmed, not in this life or the next. Thank you.